Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Trusted AI Challenge Event 2, Grounding the Critical Path. In this live stream, you will hear from subject matter experts that outline four technical challenge topics that, that have associated funding uh, where performers can submit white papers and compete for research dollars. Today's team will present details on those technical topics and also information on eligibility requirements and also on the process for submitting those white papers to compete and to play a role in this challenge series. Uh, we are very excited about today's presentation and we look forward to answering questions later on in the program. So the Trusted AI series, if you recall, kicked off back in October with our first live event where the Innovari Advancement Center hosted a panel of expert speakers from across industry, the government, and academia, academia, where we explored the future of AI, AI's potential, and started to examine the challenges associated with the safe, reliable, and robust deployment of AI systems, specifically AI systems that learn and evolve behaviors over time. At that first event, we had over 7,000 combined views with the live attendees and also later with our YouTube channel. And we are excited today to present technical challenges that were informed and, and cultivated through those early discussions. Since that first event in October, we've also held technical workshops where experts from the field have created and refined the technical challenges that are going to be presented today. Science and technology is advancing uh, at an increasingly unlinear pace. And as we talked about in the first event, nowhere is this more evident than in information science. Recent developments in AI and machine learning are removing the need for humans to closely oversee and instruct and guide and train AI systems. AI agents no longer directly depend on human interaction. And some of these agents can develop emergent cooperative behaviors and even superhuman performance. This is very promising and it's very interesting, um, but it's also a place for concern. Many of these AI agents develop techniques and methods that are very different and very complex uh, to where that humans have a hard time understanding how they work. These, these methods are different and unpredictable. So these uncertainties really must be considered. They must be considered, measured, and even mitigated if we're going to move to where we truly have bi-directional trust between artificial intelligence systems and their human teammates. So we all know that AI is important to national defense and also the global economy, but, there, but advances in artificial intelligence have much, much broader applicability to areas like medicine and um, disaster preparedness, disaster relief, uh, law enforcement, humanitarian assistance and emergency services. So the Trusted AI Challenge Series really is intended to explore the scientific and technical problems associated with developing, validating, and verifying AI systems that learn and change behaviors over time. Some of the goals of this series that we've covered before are to explore the future of AI, to publish relevant challenge problems associated with trust, to fund researchers, and to capture innovative ideas and solutions associated with trust between humans and AI systems. And finally, to expand our scientific and technology ecosystem. Today's goal is simply to expose the public to these four technical challenges uh, and to provide some information on eligibility and process. So I'd like to personally extend a thank you to our national and international partners that have made this event such a success. And I welcome and thank everyone for attending today during the second event in this Trusted AI Challenge Series. It is now my sincere honor to introduce the excellent Dr. Mira Sampath, who is the Associate Vice Chancellor of Research 
for the SUNY State University of New York. Mira, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Waisaki. Good afternoon. A very warm welcome to all of you today for this exciting second event of the Trusted AI Challenge Series. I am Meera Sampath, Associate Vice Chancellor for Research at SUNY, the State University of New York. I would like to begin by thanking our partners and co-sponsors, the Air Force Research Laboratory Information Directorate, the Air Force Office of Scientific Research, IBM Research, Ensign, the National Security Innovation Network, NYSTEC, the New York State Technology Enterprise Corporation, the Griffiths Institute, and Innovari. It has been an absolute pleasure working with you over the past several months on this Trusted AI Challenge series. Thank you for your valuable partnership and the support that has made this event possible. Dr. Vaisaki said in his opening comments, research and innovation to address reliability and resiliency, security and privacy, trust and trustworthiness in AI and autonomous systems is more critical now than ever before. There is a stronger sense of urgency now in tackling all of these issues that are fundamental to the safe and successful deployment of AI technologies. This challenge series with its focus on practical solutions that can enable the widespread acceptance and adoption of AI systems is a very timely and important initiative. SUNY, an institution that is deeply committed to advancing safe, responsible and ethical AI, is honored to be hosting this challenge series with our partners. And together we are excited to bring this opportunity to the AI R&D community. This may be an introduction to the State University of New York for some of you. So let me take just a few minutes to give you a bit of context. SUNY is the largest comprehensive system of higher education in the United States. It is comprised of 64 campuses, including research universities, comprehensive and technical colleges, and community colleges. This includes four medical schools, two dental schools, and the state's only college of optometry. To give you a sense of scale, last fall, approximately 400,000 students were enrolled in degree granting programs at SUNY campuses. SUNY serves each year about 1.3 million students in credit bearing courses, continuing education and community outreach programs. SUNY oversees nearly a quarter of all academic research conducted in New York State. Last year, research expenditure system-wide exceeded $1.7 billion, covering a very broad research portfolio. Specifically in AI, our research spans many key areas, from foundational AI science to applications in healthcare, transportation, atmospheric sciences, materials discovery and security, to next generation AI hardware. Our research focus extends from the mathematical foundations of data-driven systems to human AI partnerships, to social and ethical aspects of AI and related policy and governance. Over the last couple of years, we launched two AI institutes, the University at Buffalo AI Institute led by Dr. David Dorman, who will be facilitating the challenge problem session today, and the Institute for AI-Driven Discovery and Innovation at Stony Brook University, represented here by Dr. Scott Smolka, who will be presenting one of the challenge problems on trust in human AI collaborative systems. We launched two key partnerships, one with AFRL and today's event speaks to this collaboration and another seven year AI Alliance with IBM Research, one of our sponsors today. You will hear from Dr. Kush Vashni from IBM Research Labs soon. My sincere thanks to all of the members of the Challenge Development Committee, Dr. David Dorman, Dr. Alvaro Velasquez, Dr. Laura Steckman, Dr. Scott Smolka, and Dr. Kush Vashni for their outstanding efforts. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank once again, our distinguished speakers from the last event, the first event of the challenge series last fall, whose visionary talks set the stage for today. With that, welcome and thank you, thank you to all of you who have joined us today. I look forward to a very lively afternoon an excellent response from the academic and small business communities to the call for proposals we will be issuing today and to great ideas and collaborations from this challenge series. It is now my pleasure to invite Dr. David Dorman to kick off today's program. Thank you. Thank you, Mira. So um, those of you that don't know me, my name is De Dr. David Dorman. I'm a, a professor in computer science and engineering at the University of Buffalo. 
and the director of the AI Institute. So my role today is to facilitate the presentation of the four topics uh, that were chosen to be funded by various government agencies. Um, as you know that these topics uh, are on the critical path for es establishing trust in AI, and they're in general important across a variety of, uh, of government agencies. Uh, as you've heard from the other um, previous uh, presenters, these topics were developed from a challenge committee who've worked with various government agencies to distill these topics and to identify the funding that's going to be offered uh, to those of you that are successful in proposing a topic uh, that's of interest. Now, all of this is a larger part of an effort to bring together government, industry, academic researchers, and others to focus on trust across a wide variety of topics, including fundamental research, applied research, policy, and applications, for example. So the goal of this section is really to, this session is really to begin the conversation and introduce you to these topics. So those are the, 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 the key focus today. We're going to be sharing with you the uh, four separate topics that I've had outlined here on, the, uh, on this screen. And they're representative of a lot of different uh, government agencies' uh, needs in moving forward. The goal here is for each topic to be presented. So what I will do is I'll introduce the primary funding agency. I'll highlight um, who is eligible for the funding under this uh, particular topic. And I'll introduce the representatives who will be presenting the topics. Um, and in general, those same representatives can uh, answer questions about the vision and how this will be applied within the government. So each uh, presenter will have um, a period of time to present their topic. And when they're done, we'll have about 10 minutes for questions. Um, if you would like to ask a question, please enter those into the comments section of the live stream that you're watching right now. And um, I will note that should your questions not be addressed specifically or deemed more general, and we'll reserve them for later, uh, please um, understand that uh, we are moving some of these around and we'll try to get to as many of these questions uh, as possible. Um, if you have uh, questions specifically about the um, contracting process, about the proposals, and not particularly about a particular um, topic, we ask that you'll save those for the session that comes a little bit later. And then we'll break out into other uh, rooms on Discord later that we can talk uh, more generally with the presenters uh, and have one, uh, one on many, uh, one to many discussions about things that you might be interested in. Okay, so without uh, further ado, we're gonna move to our uh, first topic. Um, topic one is the verification of autonomous systems. This is sponsored by the Air Force Research Laboratory and the Air Force Office for Scientific Research. And Dr. Uh, Alvaro Velasquez, Velasquez um, of the Air Force Research Laboratory Information Directive will be presenting uh, the overview of this topic. Alvaro? Yes, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Very good. Let me lawyers. share my screen. Very good. Can you see my screen? We can see you. Oh, okay. Let me attempt this again. There we go. You can see my screen? Yes, we can. Great. All right. Well, um, I guess I'm starting things off and I, I want to thank everyone who showed up or who will watch this on YouTube. Uh, my name is Alvaro Velasquez, and I have been working on this topic uh, for the Trusted AI Challenge series on the verification of autonomous systems. Um, so the verification problem, of course, it's been studied for a very long time uh, in other contexts. And it's it, broadly speaking, it's uh, the problem of ensuring that certain user-defined uh, desirable behavior holds within some system. Uh, and it's been studied for a long time, but once we look at autonomous systems, there are some uh, new challenges that pop up. 
So to start things off, I want to briefly mention how uh, verification is different in AI versus machine learning. Um, and in machine learning in particular, we have some, some uh, sort of idiosyncrasies and challenges that, that we want to address under this topic. So in AI, you generally work with uh, known environments. You know the dynamics of your model. And so this is very good for automation. You can come up with ways to prescribe rules that a system should follow and so on. Um, but machine learning, as opposed to being prescriptive in this sense, is, is more predictive in nature, uh, which is what makes it useful for autonomy. It, it, it's why it allows it to, to adapt to unforeseen environments by generalizing previous experience or previous data. So it works well in unknown environments where we can either generate or leverage uh, whatever the ground truth um, data or experience uh, of the underlying phenomenon is. So when we speak of autonomous agents, this is what we mean. We mean the machine learning, uh, in particular deep learning uh, sense of the word. And what we want to focus on this topic is we want to answer the question of whether we can verify complex properties of autonomous systems. So again, these are machine learning based systems. And by complex, we mean properties that go outside of what has been considered uh, in the literature uh, for such autonomous systems. In particular, when you when you look through things like uh, the verification of neural networks competition 2020, um, and some of these some of this recent work in the area, they generally focus on one of three types of properties. Uh, we'll call them simple properties, even though the methods used to verify them are very complex and very sophisticated. The properties themselves are very simple. Usually, it's either a safety property, um, which is given some undesirable set of outcomes or, or states, we would like to make sure that our autonomous system does not encounter these, these outcomes. Uh, conversely, we have reachability properties, the second type, which is given some desirable set of outcomes or, or classification outputs or states, we want to make sure that our autonomous agent eventually observes these. Uh, and then the final one is a robustness uh, property, which is where we essentially, we want to either bound or minimize uh, the number of misclassifications, um, which has obvious use, right? If, if, you, if you're trying to classify a plane and it, it's classified as a bird, this is a misclassification. We want to make sure we minimize the number of misclassifications. And so these are the three main properties that you see in the literature. Now, that's a great starting point for verifying autonomous systems, um, but there's a much richer landscape of potential verification properties. In particular, when you look at what's been done in the verification community for many decades, you know, you have all these uh, formal logics and languages uh, to, def to design, uh, dis define and verify uh, behavioral properties, things like linear temporal logic, computation tree logic, mu calculus, uh, probabilistic variants of these and so on. Uh, they can define very complex, very interesting specifications that are not captured by safety, reachability or robustness. So I'll give one simple example. Suppose we have we want to verify that an autonomous agent must avoid hostile territory until it reaches its destination. Now, that's a very simple, seemingly innocuous property, but it's not captured by safety. It's not captured by reachability. It's not captured by robustness. And it's very easily definable as a, for example, linear temporal logic formula. So that is the crux of this topic. Can we verify complex properties, i.e. those that exist outside of safety, reachability, and robustness of autonomous systems, i.e. those that depend on a machine learning mechanism as opposed to a traditional AI mechanism? So I want to briefly talk about um, some of the motivation. Uh, a lot of you may already be familiar with some of these. But some of the motivation for why we need this verification of autonomous systems, and um, a lot of it comes from the problem of perception. Um, you know, we've, we've come up as a scientific community with these beautiful deep neural network models, uh, in particular deep convolutional neural network models since at least 2012, and, and they've performed admirably. And, and of course, before 2012, we still had deep neural networks in, in a different fashion. Um, and they perform very well, but once you try to actually stress test these using some kind of adversarial approach, you very quickly find out that these are fickle systems. So for example, here we have the, the problem of physical limitations. Um, so this is some work done uh, where you take a stop sign and you take a state-of-the-art classifier, you train it to detect stop signs, 
It does very well at detecting stop signs. But then as soon as you put these random stickers on the stop sign, it can no longer detect that it's a stop sign, right? Any Anyone on this call can easily tell this is a stop sign, but as soon as you put these black and white stickers, the classifier fails. Um, of course, that's a big problem if, if you're doing something like a perception-based um, autonomous driving system. Um, this is work done by uh, my PhD advisor on how you can introduce imperceptible perturbations to an image um, to cause a misclassification in an autonomous agent. So this is a... Uh, at the time, it, it was a state-of-the-art autonomous driving simulator where you take the image on the right and the simulator correctly detects that there is, in fact, a human in front of this wall. But then through some clever adversarial tricks, you can add imperceptible perturbations such that the image uh, right on the right, B, um, the simulator no longer detects that there's a human there. Uh, when clearly to us, these seem like the same image. So, of course, another big problem for autonomous driving. Um, this is work I presented in Ishkai two years ago. This is on how these uh, machine learning classifiers are even susceptible to nature itself. So the, the adversary could be a, a natural effect and it can still cause misclassification. So here we took images, uh, we added synthetic fog, and we saw that it causes all kinds of misclassification. So on the top, you have the correct classification that there is a traffic light in this image. And then as we add varying degrees of, uh, of fog, we start getting classifications that there's a submarine or that there's an aircraft, you know, just complete nonsense. Um, again, big problem for, for autonomous systems. Uh, finally, we have sort of an extreme case. Uh, there are some classifiers that you can even change a single pixel in Cosmos classifications, which is very concerning. Here you have various examples. Uh, for example, here you have a a then state-of-the-art classifier that detected this as a bassinet correctly. Uh, but then through some clever optimization-based approaches, we can find the one pixel that will maximally change the classification output. And once we change that pixel, the same classifier now says that this is a paper towel. Um, so these are very, very significant vulnerabilities. And they have very, very dire consequences when you think about the problem of autonomous decision-making right, uh, within the Air Force, what you might call command and control. Uh, when you leverage these perception-based agents to then arbitrate decisions within an environment, um, these, these vulnerabilities essentially compound. So what you see here, this is another uh, uh, driving simulator. On the left, you have a regular input sample, and the red arrow tells you that the autonomous agent will stay on its lane as we want it to. But then if we make the image a little bit darker in an adversarial sense, the same autonomous driving agent will now veer off the side of the road, which is of course a very bad thing. And all of these examples are um, more or less purely academic. But of course we have also seen real world cases where you, know, you get these very bad cases of unintended behavior because of uh, machine learning and, and some other technology. So, here we have uh, a Google self-driving car that caused a crash for the first time because, quote, the car assumed that the bus would yield when it attempted to merge back into traffic. Um, so this illustrates that we need verification, uh, not just for the perception problem, not just for machine learning, but for the logic that underpins a lot of this and that the logic that leverages a lot of the perception results. Um, because this wasn't particularly a perception problem. This was a more of a logic rule-based problem, but it interfaces with perception mechanisms. Uh, a second case is the fatal accident that, that uh, you may all be familiar with. This is the, the Tesla accident where the vehicle, quote unquote, um, I'm sorry, where the vehicle caused the crash because, quote, the camera failed to recognize the white truck against the bright sky. This is, again, problem of perception. It's a visual problem. Um, so, you know, these academic and real world cases show the need for verification of autonomous systems. And verification, of course, is a conduit to trust. If you can verify that a certain set of desirable behavioral properties hold within a system, you're, it's, it's much more conducive to being able to trust a set system. So a very high level view of how verification works traditionally is you have some model, a mathematical model, 
of the system you want to verify, usually an abstraction, right? Systems are very complex. We try to abstract them out to their most relevant properties. So we have this mathematical model of the system. Uh, we have a set of specifications or properties we want to um, verify whether they hold within this model. We feed it to our verification algorithm, and the verification algorithm will, says, will say yes, the model satisfies these specifications, or it'll say, depending on the technique you're using, it'll say no, and it'll give you a counterexample where the model does not satisfy the specification. You can then use this counterexample in neat ways to either refine your model, maybe retrain in the case of machine learning, and so on. So this is a sort of very high level view of verification. Now, as I mentioned in, in the beginning, there are some differences when you want to verify a traditional AI system versus when you want to verify a more modern machine learning based system. In traditional AI, you can more or less adopt existing verification procedures uh, one to one with some adaptation. Uh, the reason is because in traditional AI, we have a model of our environment, right? So we know the dynamics. And this affords us, you know, many neat opportunities. For example, since we have a model of our dynamics, we can take that model, we can take our specifications, we can compute product transition systems, and we have all these neat tricks that the verification community has come up with for many years that we can leverage in traditional AI. However, when we look at a more modern machine learning based perspective, um, this becomes a lot harder, um, perhaps even intractable. We still have our model. It's still a mathematical model, but uh, unfortunately, it's no longer interpretable in the traditional sense that makes it amenable to, to verification. Um, although some interesting work has been done there, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. But if you're given a model of a neural network, for example, you, you might have all the synaptic weights. You might know, you know your loss function, your activation functions, you know your, where your pooling layers are. You know every little detail about this model, but it's not interpretable uh, in the traditional sense. For example, if I, if I say I'm going to change a, a, an arbitrary synaptic weight by 10%, what does that mean in terms of satisfying a behavioral specification? That's not clear at all. So that introduces a significant challenge. There's also the new challenge of data. Um, how do you handle data within the verification procedure? For one thing, data is incredibly high dimensional. So it's already uh, increasing the, the the well-known combinatorial explosion problem becomes that much worse once you bring data in. Uh, and then finally, the specifications. The specifications can remain the exact same as before, but they now depend on this uninterpretable model. So a lot of the mathematically grounded approaches that would reason about a joint model either go out the window or would have to be um, sort of modified significantly in order to adopt such approaches. Um, so these, these are very significant challenges that we face when we try to verify autonomous systems. Now, some work has been done in the literature to address some of these challenges, both from a verification as well as a testing standpoint, um, although generally one would want to do both within a system. But from a verification standpoint, to the extent that you can compute at least an approximate model of your machine learning system, you can do things like compute product transition systems. You can take a the finite transition system version of your specification, the finite transition system version of your model, and compute a, a, a product transition system where if you reach certain states, that means you satisfy the property. Uh, there are some very neat tricks there that have been done in the verification community, in particular, the, the model checking and controller synthesis communities. Um, there's linear programming that has been used successfully to, to verify uh, safety properties of neural networks. Um, as you may know, you can take a slice of a neural network and it's basically just a bunch of linear operations. Uh, if you take the nonlinear activation functions of neural networks, there are ways to linearize these. For example, a, a rectified linear unit, it's just two lines. You can easily uh, linearize this. So once you do that, you can adopt linear programming, you can adopt energy linear programming branch and bound algorithms, dynamic programs, all of this is now afforded to you um, when you frame neural networks as this sort of set of linear functions. Um, so that's a lot of what has been done in the verification community and the testing community. Of course, you have your black box, gray box, white box testing. Black box means, you know, you don't have access to your machine learning model. So you have to go off of strictly input and output pairs. Gray box, you have some access. Um, 
white box you have full access with white box you know exactly what each synaptic weight is what the activation functions are and so that lets you do some some very neat things uh, reinforcement learning for testing has also been explored uh, where reinforcement learning agents are essentially autonomous decision making agents acting in an environment um, such that positive reinforcement guides them in the direction of good actions in this case the positive reinforcement is simply getting the system to break down uh, so by coming up with a good reinforcement learning agent uh, as a side effect you essentially get a bunch of good tests of, of where your um, behavioral specification does not hold within the system there's differential testing where you take an ensemble of a, a bunch of different machine learning models and you come up with optimization procedures to to generate an input that maximizes the difference in output of all the uh, machine learning models, uh, which basically means that your whatever your specification is, it's not holding in a bunch of these models. And finally, there's this uh, notion of neuron coverage that has also been explored, where uh, there are clever ways to come up with inputs that trigger as many of the neurons of a neural network as possible. Um, this is afforded to us in a, in a very cool way because uh, deep neural networks are differentiable systems, right? You want to compute the partial derivatives of weights within the neural network such that you minimize some loss function, which is the error. Um, in neuron coverage, you kind of do the opposite. You want to change the values of your inputs such that as many of the neurons fire. So it's still a differential calculus problem, which is very neat. And it's, a, it's an analog to traditional code coverage, right? And in traditional verification, if you have a program you want to verify, you have a control flow graph version of that program, um, would constitute a good test is being able to explore as much of that control flow graph as possible. So this is basically an analog of that. So all, all of this has been explored and I'm sure much more in the literature, but again, this, this, is the, this is the crux of this topic is that most of this has focused on the simple properties of safety, i.e. make sure you reach some desirable states. I'm sorry, i.e. make sure you avoid bad states. Reachability, which is make sure you reach some desirable states, and robustness, which is to make sure we minimize the number of misclassifications. Again, very important, very good properties. But what we want to focus on as part of this topic is whether we can do the same for more complex properties. Can we verify, for example, some subset of linear temporal logic, right? Can we verify that A holds until B holds, right? These are simple properties that are not captured by safety, reachability, or robustness, and that are very applicable to command and control settings in particular. So with that, I'll finalize by giving some brief guidance on proposal submissions. Um, as I just mentioned, what we want is this novel, either verification and or testing solution to verify complex behavioral specifications in an autonomous system. And we would prefer that prospective performers um, either adopt some well-known formal logic for verification, like linear temporal logic, computation tree logic, mu calculus, and so on and so forth. Or perhaps more exciting, maybe prospective performers can define their own novel logic to handle the idiosyncrasies of autonomous systems. At any rate, it's preferred to have some mathematical grounding of what the specifications are. So even though it is not necessary, it, it is strongly preferred. Um, we also don't want to restrict the creativity of our performers. So the proposed solutions can be during the design or the test phases of the autonomous system. It can be during the learning or the inference phases of the learning algorithms. And it can be within the context of various problems. This can be classification or regression or something I personally find more interesting, and it's something that uh, Dr. Wasaki mentioned in the introduction, um, or it can be applied to decision-making problems, things like reinforcement learning and planning, where we've seen, uh, in some cases, superhuman performance in things like Go, StarCraft, Dota, uh, and so on. Finally, as an expected deliverable, we prefer a formal theory of what the verification or testing procedure is, uh, one that is conducive to either a conference or journal publication, um, barring that, or perhaps as a complement to that, a working demo uh, showing the effectiveness of the verification or testing procedure. So with that, I'll, I'll leave some useful references. Uh, people that are interested in this topic, I think will be interested in these AFOSR and DARPA programs, uh, Brett Pokinis, uh, 
He leads the Agile Science of Test and Evaluation AFOSR program. Uh, very good work being done there. And there are a bunch of other programs, so the DARPA's Guard program, Assured Autonomy, Explainable AI. So, yeah, thank you. Great, uh, thank you very much. Um, I think that's a, this is a general area that I think is very applicable to many areas of the government. So um, we do have a couple questions that have come in. Um, so let me start off with one here um, about the vision of, of, of AI to work in unknown environments. So um, humans can do that fairly well. And it's not exactly clear what criteria we use to verify that somebody is going to be able to work in one of these unknown environments. Uh, perhaps it's you know, how well they've done in, in previous unknown environments, what their training is, what their background is, what their general knowledge is. Uh, but it's pretty well known that machine learning algorithms like deep learning uh, don't work very well in these unknown, unknown environments. Is this gonna be something that, um, that verification can solve? Or is this a more general problem of uh, the current approach to AI systems? Uh, I, I would say this is unfortunately a more general problem. So I agree that deep learning does not work well in unknown environments, but it's probably what works best in unknown environments as far as we know. So it's, it's a pretty dire situation that we're in. When you wanna generalize from high dimensional data, uh, deep learning empirically works fairly well. Unfortunately, it's very fickle. So I think um, ultimately, perhaps there will be some new way of generalizing that is not based on deep neural networks um, that we will apply verification to. Verification will not solve this problem. There will be some, probably some new leap in deep learning that we will then apply verification to. Uh, but verification is hopeless here. I mean, verification is very bad with dimensionality to begin with. So <laughs> it's, it's, it's ill-suited to solve the, the, the true underlying problem. So, so how do you uh, see this affecting real life application development? I mean, the government often contracts for, for different projects. They want to verify uh, performance before they actually put something out in the field. Is this gonna be the case where um, we're, application development is really gonna be stifled by our inability to, uh, to verify these more complex unknown world systems? Are we gonna have to limit ourselves to very simple applications? Or do you see a, uh, some uh, path through this set of weeds? Um, I, I suspect we'll probably be limited to very simple application verification suite for the, for the military. So that as we develop these applications, we can actually run them through this. Um, we, have, we have some programs at AFRL that have attempted to do something like this for classification. Uh, so that's encouraging. Uh, but across the DOD, I don't really know of any uh, sort of well-established verification suite. Uh, that's what I would like to see. Okay. So do you anticipate in any way these systems being able to um, verify or guarantee that they're not operating outside of the parameters that you've already verified? Or um, is that uh, part of the verification process that, that uh, we verify that they're not going to be operating outside of, uh, uh, of known parameters. The, and the, yeah, that's, that's the tricky thing. So if, if we could adopt some kind of mathematically grounded formal verification, uh, which is something that has been done in other settings, uh, again, in traditional AI, if you have a decision-making agent uh, represented as, let's say, a Markov chain or a Markov decision process, and you have some behavioral specifications, you can represent these as a kind of graph, an automaton. Uh, there are mathematically grounded ways where you can guarantee certain behavior, right? I would, I would like that to be the case in deep learning, but I don't see how that could possibly happen. I think more likely we won't be able to know when we're outside the bounds of the parameters that we've already verified. Um, because even if we adopt mathematically grounded approaches, they would most likely be on a very abstract version of the true data because that data is so high dimensional. So even if you came up with quote unquote rigorous mathematical guarantees, the abstraction might be uh, too too strong or too strong or too weak of an abstraction if, if, if you see what I mean. Uh, so I, I don't think we would be able to get outside of that. I think the best we can hope for is maybe um, 
a testing-based approach or, again, an overly abstracted, mathematically grounded approach, but we would never be able to give full guarantees. Okay. Um, sort of related here, uh, there's another question basically that, you know, the, the, the sort of the vision of autonomous uh, behaviors is in fact to, uh, to operate in these unknown environments, similar to what uh, you said and, and uh, you know, the ultimate vision of, of, of what we want to do. But um, there's, there's also a common belief that um, some of this lack of robustness or this um, susceptibility to uh, adversarial perturbations is a result of a, a, a lack of more general knowledge. So humans are very good, you know, at, at filling in the blanks, um, you know, things change and, uh, you know, we see a stop sign with a sticker on it, even if our, our mind tells us at first, you know, it's something different. Um, we have a lot more general knowledge to, to rely on. Um, do you see this as, as, it, as, a, as a really a stumbling block or is it really possible to verify, you know, unknown operations in, in a more, without this more general knowledge? I think we, we need the more, the more general knowledge. And, and I think, uh, again, I think this is a fundamental limitation of, um, of deep learning, perhaps more so than verification. Uh, when you consider what some of the, you know, the, the, some of the greats in deep learning have said about how, how bad, you know, deep learning actually is in terms of efficiency, you know, uh, they've said that the use of backpropagation, that's most likely not the most efficient way of doing things. Uh, pooling layers within neural networks is a, apparently a disaster, according to one of its creators. Um, and when you look at, at these state-of-the-art planning uh, reinforcement learning systems, it took 29 million games to beat the world Go champion. We have no idea what a human looks like if, if, if they could play 29 million games of Go. So it's terribly data inefficient. These all point to a deeper problem in deep learning that I think has to be resolved before we can truly verify uh, generalizable autonomous systems. I and mean, even before we can a adopt them, I would say, uh, in safety critical applications. Okay, great. Um... That looks like it covers most of the questions. Um, one thing that I will say, I, I failed to do this at the beginning. This is um, open to US and international academic institutions. Um, and uh, we'll uh, talk to you a little bit later. Is there anything else you wanted to say before, uh, before we move on to the next topic? I, I wanted to just you know thank everyone for their attention. And uh, if they have any questions, feel free to reach out. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Okay, let's uh, move on now to the uh, second topic. Um, this topic is in uh, human and artificial intelligence performance optimization, trust and joint action for digital data analysis. And this is a topic um, also sponsored by AFRL and AFOSR. Uh, eligibility is for U.S. and uh, academic, U.S. and international academic institutions. And the topic presenter today is Dr. Laura Steckman of the Air Force Office of Scientific Research. So welcome, and uh, we'd like to uh, hear from you about your uh, topic and uh, how it's going to help our government. Great, well, thank you, David, and thank you everyone for taking time out of your day to join us here. So it is a really exciting time to be working on trust and in artificial intelligence research. Last month, the US National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence released its strategy and recommendations. And among these, the commission stressed the need for investments in human AI interaction and teaming. Specifically, it called for multidisciplinary research to enhance such interaction in addition to the need for design developments that optimize human AI interaction. Recently as well, the US National Artificial Intelligence Initiative has emphasized the importance of advancing trustworthy AI, which incorporates elements of trust and trustworthiness as scientific constructs into the technology. And the US is not alone in its focus on trust in AI research, as there are research development efforts worldwide to ensure development of safe, reliable, and ethical systems that meet societal needs. In fact, just last week, the EU Commission is discussing a proposal to basically lay the foundation for a legal framework that revolves solely
fully around trust and trustworthiness. And you can find that online if you search for it. Here, it, it aligns with all of these efforts. Um, the, to, <laughs> so, okay. It aligns with all of these efforts for research to advance the current state of trust in human AI with an emphasis on joint action. Trust in AI research is nascent, but rapidly growing. It builds off trust in automation research, which has thus far remained the basis for trust-related research. Persisting as technological advances have occurred for human machine interaction. The current preferred definition for trust is that it is the attitude that an agent will help achieve an individual's goals in a situation characterized by uncertainty and vulnerability. With this definition, there is a solid basis for conceptualizing trust and expanding the construct to encompass optimal human AI interaction. So there are two approaches to trust research. The most often discussed with the current state of the research focuses on the machine, and at present is better placed into the category of trustworthiness or the perception that the system is able to be trusted. Put simply, one of the AI-enabled systems that many people use today is a global positioning system or GPS. In this instance, the GPS device is a tool that one must assess for trustworthiness. So for example, they might ask questions like, does the system work as intended? Does it aid in reaching the destination quickly, avoiding major roadblocks? Is it safe? Does it have settings that let the user decide what data it stores or shares with other systems? When yes is the answer to most or all of these questions, most people consider the tool trustworthy. Ensuring that a machine or artificial intelligence system is trustworthy has a number of aspects and components. Among them, but in no particular order, are concepts such as security, safety, accountability, transparency, privacy, legal compliance, and resilience. More recently, there's also been a focus on ethics, ensuring that a system adheres to social norms and protects individual goals and becomes more intelligent, these components will remain of utmost importance. Over time, they are poised to become foundational leaders. There's already a small but growing body of research in this area experimenting with artificial intelligence techniques to program machines to assess human trustworthiness and respond in different ways. ways when the human's behavior suggests that interactions with the system are not optimal. While the machine-focused trustworthiness is important, the other approach to trust is highly relevant to the challenge topic, referring to a human's willingness and attitude to rely on or be vulnerable to a machine or artificial intelligence agent. To trust the AI, especially when it has greater degrees of autonomy to decide or act, creates a partnership. In this case, that's a human-AI partnership. Trust in this context then becomes even more important because when there could be a real world impact, even if only very small, a human must be able to depend on the artificial intelligence to perform its designated role effectively as programmed. Trusting that AI is critical for success. Considerations for trust in the research include a person's propensity or disposition to trust technology. They also include considerations for situational trust and learned trust. There are also dimensions of trust, which involve cognitive and affective processes in the human, and often both. There are also aspects for trust that address communication, anthropomorphic or human-based characteristics, as well as human factors, human interaction with the AI. All of these dimensions, components, and considerations are potential variables for inquiry in regards to trust in AI. In addition, trust has some additional complexities. It represents a dynamic process that evolves and changes over time. It can increase or decrease according to specific incidents. For this reason, ongoing trust calibration is critical to ensure that a human neither overtrusts nor undertrusts the system. Overtrust can lead to not paying attention to a system. It could mean potentially missing signs that the AI is not functioning properly. A system could make decisions that a person either does not comprehend or misinterprets whereas undertrust can lead to paying so much attention to the system that hinders completion of the task, which often ends in disuse of that system. What is required here is calibrated trust. Calibrated trust occurs when trust in the system matches the calibration has also been shown to 
to improve performance positively in teaming. It conserves human cognitive resources and results in more desirable outcomes. Therefore, theoretically, trust should enhance human AI performance and calibrated trust should optimize collaboration. There is even further potential to explore the trust construct in the context of joint action, which should be a consideration for the proposed challenge solution. As you know, trust is a key aspect to the challenge topic, yet it's not the only one. So one of the current mantras surrounding artificial intelligence as while enabling the human to do what it does best, or he or she does best. The benefits to this interaction are potentially greatest or repetitive automated tasks to more complex ones, where the artificial intelligence can sift through larger amounts of information faster and deliver synthesized analytics in mere seconds compared to a human. When successful, this model enables people to concentrate on what they do do best, such as on the aspects of the task areas where humans continue to excel over machines. The challenge topic asks for a solution where the artificial intelligence focuses on digital data analytics to deliver timely, accurate information to humans. The partnership here is one of joint action. To classify the human machine, or in this case, human AI partnership, there are two primary relationship types they might emulate. One is the teaming model, which requires collaboration and shared objectives, while the other is joint action, a relationship wherein the human and AI have distinct and objective of one or both to be successful. In this challenge topic, the human and AI are not teammates. Ultimately, they have different functions and no shared objective. However, their co cooperation is paramount to completing accurate, timely analyses that would correspond to their specific assignments. The AI will ingest digital data, which could be in structured or unstructured formats and include multiple media types, such as text, imagery, perhaps sound, or maybe even another format that would be up to the proposers. It will focus on reporting this data as scheduled. It should also cooperate with the human or humans to report on topics, themes, or patterns that the human requires. To do this well, the AI must adapt to the demand signals of one or more human background on this topic might be useful in shaping a proposal. This topic originated after a senior U.S. Department of Digital Service. To do so would require the ability to analyze significant amounts of digital or digitized data in multiple formats rapidly and efficiently. It's a challenge that applies not only to the US Department of Defense, but across nations, industries, and academia with the potential to enhance knowledge. Due to the amount of data, which increases exponentially almost every day, the most promising way to solve the issue is to cooperate with the machines and let them do what they do best. The capacity to process and analyze large amounts of data quickly is a feat that AI can already deliver on, it requires the system learn and adapt. Think of it, can you imagine being in school and having an AI delivered an annotated bibliography on your areas of interest, databases, or even time in physical archives, you'd start with a list of highly relevant research articles as a seed point to build on. Or perhaps uh, there's a group at a think tank that's monitoring the web for different topics. They might need to report on different schedules and might require entirely different charts, infographics, or analytics to share these analysis. AI partnership for digital data analytics could enhance how we turn data into knowledge and can know about humanity in the world around us. Laura, we seem to be having some trouble with your uh, connection. Um, I'm not sure if it's uh, running on, uh, yes. on few. The number of potential research questions to use on vast amounts of data, such as we're discussing here, are almost infinite. And as the digital data grows, those research possibilities increase, essentially, to great scientific advancement. A successful
All right, it seems like we might have lost uh, we might have lost Laura completely. Uh, I noticed that the uh, connection seemed to be getting a little bit worse, but I uh, assume that we're still online and I see other people moving. So, uh, oh, there you are, you're back again. Oh, we lost you there for a second. Can you hear us okay, Laura? What happened here? Um, I can hear you. So I'm not sure, but um, you're starting to break can up Can you hear me? Yeah, you're starting to break up a lot. So maybe just pause in between your sentences. Um, could you go back to basically where you started talking about what a successful um, uh, proposal might include? Because uh, you started breaking up pretty bad right there. And um, we can uh, see if we can uh, get back into the uh, uh, back into the flow here. Hey, uh, Dave and Laura, it's Mike. Um, one suggestion we had from the tech team, Dave, if you could maybe just push the introductory slide that you had and have Laura uh, just turn your video off, that might help I'm with- I'm happy to uh, try. Audio strong. Worth a try. Thank you. No, uh, thank you. And, and, and thank you for, for, for working through this. Um, all right, so let me take a step back. So a successful proposal will provide novel solutions that integrate trust calibration and agent learning or adaptation into human AI joint action analytic tasks. If any of these areas might need to be addressed in later years, proposers should mention this in the white paper. While it is not guaranteeable for future additional funding after the initial award period. As a final note, keep in mind that this topic calls for bold, novel solutions. It asks proposers to be creative in approaching how there are opportunities for multidisciplinary collaboration. collaboration. Proposers may envision additional pieces relevant to the solution that are not mentioned in the challenge topic. If there is some additional aspect required to solve the topic challenge, proposers are encouraged to include it when preparing a white paper. Explain why it is included and how it advances the challenge solution. Be innovative, be creative. We are looking forward to reading your submissions. So thank you very much for your time and your patience. All right, I lost my unmute button there. Uh, thank you. That helped a little bit. Um, still broke up a little bit. So I have a slide here um, up, uh, Laura, that basically gives the summary that you had in the uh, RFP. And so people can take a look and, uh, and read that. Um, I see there might be a, a few questions coming in. Um, so clearly this is, is different from uh, autonomous systems in that you have a human uh, in the loop. Um, one question is, is how the way humans learn to trust each other, um, how can those kinds of things be mapped to this problem that we're dealing with uh, in this topic? Yeah, so thank you for the question. That's absolutely a fantastic question. So yes, there's actually a debate in the research as to whether or not they map very well. Um, the answer map to from human-human uh, trust to, uh, because the machines yet right now are still many of them in that stage of being a tool and not yet may change. Uh, we also have to recognize that the trust in AI research, talking about trust that really focuses on the definition that we just covered is really nascent. There are about 60 to 70 articles total right now that really go into detail, go out and find them and read them. And so that, that is really one place where the research is right now is figuring out how to map, if it maps, that human to human trust answer to that. But we
it sounds like it's buffering a little. That's why I was uh, letting it go. But uh, it looks like um, maybe we have some uh, uh, some more serious uh, buffering problems coming up here. Um, I see that it looks like uh, well, she, looks like Laura is still connected here, but uh, we're not hearing you very much, Laura. So, so David, this is Brian. Yeah, I, this is unfortunate, but I think for now, let's, I think I'm back. We can give it one more try, and I think if the if the connection goes down again, then then we'll press on, and then that'll give us time to address some of these technical issues and perhaps answer some more questions at the end of the other presentations. But we can give this another chance um, if we want to take a quick try. Thank you, Wilmer. Uh, sure. Um, so. Um... So we were we get we lost a little bit of you at the at the end there, but uh, I think uh, to summarize, um, you know, there, there, there's a concern, of course, in the in the research area about how this uh, happens. Uh, there's another question um, that uh, deals with how um, and what kinds of artifacts are being measured in the ability to identify humans' trustworthiness within an AI system. So this is kind of the other way, you know, how does a human, uh, or how does an AI system evaluate a human's trustworthiness? So that is a fantastic question. So in terms of measurements, you have a, a growing body of research that's looking at psychophysiological metrics. So ones that use different biomarkers, different brain waves, different other uh, physiological signals, as well as observable psychological behaviors on the human side. On the machine side, there are a number of attempts right now to apply different types of, uh, I think there's some reinforcement learning, inverse reinforcement learning. There's some other attempts to use different types of AI programming and techniques to really teach the machine how to interpret the human's behavior. So that area of research is growing right now and would probably be of interest in this topic. Okay, great. great. Um, maybe we'll try one more. Um, so. This is sort of related to the previous one. I'm going to kind of combine two questions here. Um, that uh, one of the one of the listeners noted that there's a lot of biases that get imparted into AI, and um, and we of course need to mitigate these biases. But in our um, work with AI systems, this can be uh, particularly troubling for the trust problem. In particular, you know, if we have one of these perturbations, you know, and somebody says, you know. Ah, you know, it's a it's a stop sign, and then all of a sudden they say it's a cow. Um, you know, we're gonna stop trusting it pretty darn quick. But if it was a more reasonable um, sort of uh, a misclassification, you know, this is a uh, you know a Jersey cow versus a different kind of cow, um, we might be more accepting as humans for that. Um, do you see that that is an important problem? And then, sort of related to that. Do you think, like the previous problem, that's going to affect development? Are we going to have to deal with just very simple problems uh, when we talk about trust um, between humans and, and systems? Oh, so that's about four really fantastic questions. Um, all right. So I'm sorry about start that. With... That was my fault. Uh, I, can, I can repeat any of them as you go through. Go <laughs> okay. Well, we, we might have to. But um, to start with, so if we really get into it, Trust is a life cycle problem for artificial intelligence. Um, when you talk about things like bias, you're, you need to talk about, first of all, the data that you're looking at and trust in that data. I am not convinced that this particular challenge problem can solve the trust and data uh, issue, but if it can, fantastic, because uh, that's one of the first places to start. But then there's also the trust in uh, the algorithm development, making sure as that algorithm is de being developed, it follows all ethical standards. It is looking to mitigate biases wherever possible um, so to then use that in testing to improve the AI. Then there's a whole piece of trust from the developers once the, the AI is developed to then putting that out in the world, um, whether that's in the wild or whether that's into some type of product and making sure that the people who use it are, are able to do so and trust it. Um, I, I think different entities would have different, uh, I mean, they should be considering the entire life cycle, um, but they, they may have different focuses. Um, I would be interested in a, a really innovative 
submission or proposal starting to think about this, um, realizing that in the one year award, it may not be possible to address every single issue in the life cycle of developing an AI, especially in regards to trust. I think I need you to repeat some more questions because I got really excited about that one. Okay, um, so I guess uh, one of these things is, you know, what do you think moving forward, uh, you know, as I, as I claimed in the introduction, uh, these are things that are sort of these, these problems or these topics are things that are on the critical path uh, to more general um, solutions that hopefully in a decade or two decades are going to be commonplace. What do you see as this uh, trust problem um, between humans and, and, and machines um, being a, do you do you see that as being a limit on development in the next, you know, short term, say under a decade, um, or are we going to just have to uh, learn to trust these systems uh, as we start to deploy them and use them? Oh, great question. Uh, so this is why, although at a very high level in the talk, I wanted to mention several of the different dimensions, types, and considerations for trust. So when you're talking about learning to trust, learn trust is actually a facet or component of the trust construct scientifically. And, and that is one way that, that people learn to trust. Um, that might be a way that machines then learn to trust humans. So, so that is a piece of it. There's also situational. There might be certain situations where a person would trust an AI or machine and other situations where they wouldn't. Um, so you, you also have th these I mean, there, there's so many, I could go back through my talk and pull them all out for you. And there's a lot of research that underpins all of them. Again, I just addressed them at a high level. So do I see trust as a hindrance to development? I see trust as an absolute requirement for development to develop ethical AI and uh, trustworthy AI. I, I don't think we're gonna get where we wanna get. If you look at, to at the beginning of my talk, I, I mentioned some of the, let's see, the National Security Commission on AI, their report, also the kind of focuses of the US, uh, let's see if I get this right, um, National AI Initiative, I believe that's, if I get the acronym right, um, and, and everything they're looking at is to build this trustworthy AI, and that's trustworthy so that the public can trust it, and, and that it has um, very positive effects for society. So I think that trust absolutely must be incorporated in this development. Um, I, I realize if you're trying to get something to market really quickly, depending on what your interests are, um, maybe that is a challenge. Um, having said that, you know, trust is something we need to be thinking about today, if not yesterday, and will definitely be a focus for development in the future. Okay, great. great. Um, let me ask one more question um, and see if any other ones come in. Um, do you think that machines will eventually need to, um, I, I was trying to think of the right word to, to put here, it's not really coddle, it's not really walk on eggshells, it's sort of, do you think it'll need to adapt to humans' Uh, behaviors and expectation in order to convince humans that it can be trusted? Or do you think this will be something that has to be built in from the very beginning uh, of this system? Um, you know, some one, one person might trust easier than another person, for example. And if we're really going to be working with these machines, do you think that will eventually be a, a problem that needs to be addressed? Okay, so when talking about how a person trusts technology, you're talking about their propensity or disposition to trust. There is a lot of research in that space right now, including some of the different, if you will, putting people into different categories of how well and to what degree they trust technology. And we can break those variables down much further. And there, there are cultural variables, there are uh, generational variables, it seems according to the research, there are gender variables. So if we're getting into kind of individual people, I, I think there are a lot of considerations for that that, that we must consider. Um, but I think I got away from with your, I got focus on your example versus the question uh, more broadly. Can you go back and repeat that one more time, please? I was just wondering if, if you think that um, machines are going ah. to have to have a process built in where they can um, gauge a person's uh, need for trust and uh, work to ensure them that they can be trustworthy. 
So absolutely. Um, you know, one of the goals, and, and at least in other parts of my organization, is to support research on machine intelligence. And of course, there everybody across the world, that seems to be the next step. And there is an interest in getting to artificial general intelligence, uh, AGI. Um, as the machines get more intelligent, they're going to be able to adapt. I, I mean, think about what happens if you go, you're driving home and you tell Alexa, Alexa, preheat my oven to whatever, 350 degrees Fahrenheit, and Alexa comes back and says no. Um, that's probably going to need to have a dialogue. I mean, maybe the reason is your pilot light went out and it's not safe to turn on the stove. Maybe it is that somehow, and, and granted we'd be getting into other technologies, it realized that the only thing to put in the oven is uh, some type of meat that expired two days ago. Um, so as the machines are able, and, and I don't think that's coming anytime soon where Alexa would tell you no, um, but as the machines get more intelligent and they need to be able to make decisions to accomplish what they're programmed to do, sometimes that may not align really well with, with what a human uh, thinks it need or he or she needs or, or wants to, to have. And so um, there may come a time, and, and, and just think, you know, people tend to be, not always, I'm generalizing a little bit, creatures of habit. I mean, what if every morning you went into your office and you sat down and you were working with your, your machine or AI teammate and you normally, you know, you got your coffee, you checked your email, whatever your normal steps were, and your team partner, your AI partner realized that if you do step four before you get your coffee, you're going to have a very successful day and you're going to get something accomplished ahead of schedule that's going to make everybody in your office extremely happy. I, you know, I don't have any specifics for that offhand. The, machine, the AI may have to explain to you, no, 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 I know you get your coffee first, but really trust me, and this is a trust question, if you go do, I don't know, the photocopying first then and then get your coffee, this is going to be a fabulous day and we're going to complete everything on our agenda and maybe even be able to leave early. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm kind of making a, a somewhat hyperbolic example, but as the machines become more intelligent, there is going to be a need to have that dialogue and sometimes that dialogue may need to include persuasion. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much. I think... Um, this is one of those examples where um, I'm certainly going to go and uh, look at some of the work uh, in this area myself because it's uh, very it's very fascinating. I will say, however, I was trying to get um, Siri to talk to Alexa in my car uh, over the weekend, and Siri actually told me no, and uh, I was confused. But maybe um, that's something that uh, is just between those two companies. So we'll see. But uh, thank you very much, and uh, we'll look forward to talking to you later in the uh, open uh, sessions uh, on um, uh, on uh, Discord. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, so the third topic is dynamic bidirectional trust in human AI collaborative systems. This is a little bit different. Um, it's sponsored by the National Security Innovation Network and NISTEC. Uh, it's open to U.S. academic institutions and small businesses, and this is uh, presented by uh, my colleague at Stony Brook University and director of the AI Institute there, uh, Dr. Scott Smollett. So if you are ready, I'll turn it over to you and uh, watch for questions coming in through the live comments. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Nick. Yeah, Steve Skeena is the director of the AI Institute. Okay, let me share my screen. Can everyone uh, see my slide? Yep, we can. Thank you. Okay, great. Just double checking. All right. So um, my, my talk actually has some things in common with the previous two talks by Alvaro and Laura. So you'll see that as, as uh, we move along. So the, the topic is slightly different. I, I just reworded it slightly. Establishing bidirectional trust in human AI collaborative systems. Um, and as David mentioned, I'm from Stony Brook University. And I, I wanna focus on this topic 
in the context, at least for this presentation, the purposes of this presentation in the context of commercial and military aviation. Uh, I think that's a good area to look at the question of establishing bi-directional trust between AI and humans. Uh, but other, other application areas are certainly possible. And one of the uh, reasons for focusing on this area is because of the well-documented history of, of incidents and accidents and quite frankly, disasters in the uh, aviation industry. So here, these two uh, plots uh, give you an idea from the beginning of, of uh, aerospace, if you will, and around 1918 to the present, what the situation has looked like. And on the left, you see the number of fatalities over that period of time. And on the right, you see the number of incidents or accidents. And obviously there's some peaking going on around World War II, but other than that, you can see what the trends look like. They're similar for the two plots, but still even, even today, we have uh, over a thousand uh, fatalities, air disaster fatalities uh, per year. And you know, approximately 120 incidents uh, per year. You know, can can we do better? Uh, I think we would all agree that some some help is needed here, and maybe bringing AI into the mix in in certain ways can, can provide that uh, that assistance. So, a little bit more about the history of air disasters. Um, so. Since 1970, the total number of fatalities due to aviation incidents or accidents is 83,772 people. That's, that's a large number. The total number of incidents is 11,164. So that, that's something to, uh, to uh, reflect on. The first, just, just for historical purposes, the first recorded accident goes back to 1918. This was a good year, Dir dirigible, the Wingfoot Air Express caught fire, crashed in, in Chicago into the Illinois Trust and Savings Building, killing 13 people, three out of the five on board, the dirigible and 10 others on the ground with 27 others on the ground injured. So that's the first recorded accident, quite notable. And then more recent notable accidents, I'm, I'm focusing on uh, the Lion Air, Six flight 610 um, in, this is in uh, 19, excuse me, 2018. Uh, it crashed into the Java Sea shortly after takeoff, all 189 on board perished. And in 2019, Ethiopian Air Flight Airlines Flight 302, uh, both of these are Boeing 737 MAX 8. This crashed near Bishof to Ethiopia shortly after takeoff. And um, as I think most of you recognize that this has to do with the MCAS uh, flight control software design flaw in there. So um, as I said, this is more, no, more recent um, incidents. Now, uh, let me move on. Uh, and this is just a picture of the Goodyear dirigible I was talking about, just so you can have an idea of what it looked like in 1918. So what are the most common causes of aviation accidents? And I just, again, want to go through this background information to set the scene for uh, the partnering of AI and, and humans in this context. So uh, in, in the cockpit, to be exact. Uh, so what are the most common causes of aviation accidents? So the, the number one is, is pilot error. This could be due to a number of, of uh, reasons, for example, Poor training, lack of experience, fatigue, intoxication, and, and, uh, and, other, um, and other human factors um, or human issues. Mechanical failure accounts for about 20% of aviation crashes. Can be anything from engine failure uh, to poor repairs. Uh, a um, Extremely noteworthy example of a mechanical failure is a 1980 crash, 1985 crash of Japan Airlines Flight 123, which was the result of uh, quote unquote improper repairs by Boeing on the plane's uh, pressure bulkhead system. And uh, this led to a de decompression 
decompressurization of the of, of the airplane, uh, leading to the total loss of life. Uh, this is the largest uh, air disaster in terms of the numbers of people that lost their lives ever. It was in the in the uh, area of 540 people who had lost their lives in this 1985 crash due to improper repairs. Uh, weather is another mitigating factor, as you might expect, snow, fog, heavy rainstorms. The National Tra uh, Transportation Safety Board a study has shown that more than two thirds of all uh, weather related aviation crashes have been fatal. So weather is certainly a, a major factor. There's other human error errors that uh, play a role. Pilots, for example, pilots are not the only ones responsible for ensuring air safety. Air traffic controllers, dispatch, dispatchers, and maintenance engineers all play a role. And then there are simply other factors, sabotage, terrorist attacks, such as 9-11, uh, unexplained disappearances, et cetera, et cetera, have all played a role. So uh, this, this is just wanted to give you this picture of the, of the landscape. So with what with that background, you know, why introduce um, AI into the cockpit? How how can this uh, improve improve the situation? Well, for one, uh, the and I'm going to use the uh, the term the terminology in my talk going forward for the humans in the cockpit. I'm just going to refer to them as uh, pilot and potentially co-pilot, as opposed to like in commercial aviation, you would use the term. Um, the terms, I'm blanking out on them at the moment, but um, uh, so the second, the co-pilot is called a uh, first officer and the uh, the pilot is called the captain. So you have captain and first officer. So, so the pilot can rely on AI for assistance in some of these stressful situations I outlined in my previous slides where the pilot, for example, the pilot can be overwhelmed by flight conditions, bad weather, poor visibility, uh, weight turbulence uh, from uh, an aircraft that took off, um, say, within a minute or two uh, prior to the current aircraft, and, and just an overwhelming amount of cockpit alarms and, and warnings, and potentially not enough familiarity with the cockpit design by, by pilots. So this, all of these can uh, lead to uh, overwhelming flight conditions. So the pilot can you know, voluntarily ask for help from the AI in these situations. Now the AI can alternatively wrest control away from the, uh, from the uh, pilot and take control of the aircraft if it believes the dangerous situation is imminent, or if it thinks, again, that the pilot is behaving irresponsibly, uh, unreliably, or even dangerously. Uh, there are well-documented cases of uh, pilots, commercial airline pilots that uh, uh, were suicidal and, um, and um, murderous and crashed the, uh, the airplane uh, intentionally. So uh, very, a, a very uh, upsetting situation, obviously. Now, the uh, pilot, on the other hand, can disable the AI if the tables are turned and thinks the AI is trustworthy. So these are just some of the considerations that a, uh, a proposer should take into account when thinking about how and why to introduce AI into the cockpit. Now, what about the question of establishing bi-directional trust, uh, again, between the AI and, and, the, uh, and, the, uh, and the humans on board in the cockpit? So for the, to establish human trust in the AI, uh, we can go back to some of the uh, things that were discussed in the previous talks that uh, Alvaro mentioned, DNN testing and verification techniques. Uh, these can certainly be used in this context. Um, now, these techniques are usually performed offline, but one of the areas I'm interested in, which would be uh, very uh, applicable and appropriate for this context, is online um, runtime monitoring or verification of the AI. So this is another um, 
interesting direction for, for this uh, problem area. Now, something that we also have to take in a, into account when, uh, when it's about establishing trust in the AI is AI is, are, are, constant, are constantly evolving due to retraining. So the uh, internal weights and the structure can be evolving through, due to retraining. So a periodic reevaluation re of the AI is going to be required in such situations. Now, establishing trust by the AI in the human, you know, how, how, do, how do we establish that the AI trusts the human? Well, this will involve, as, as Laura was uh, addressing. This will involve expertise in a number of disciplines, including, at least in this particular context, control theory, avionics, human factors, AI itself, and uh, human psychology, stress management, uh, and, and related topics. The problem can be made more complex by adding a co-pilot into the mix. I've just up to this point been talking about the interaction between the AI, the onboard AI and the pilot. Now let's suppose you have a second human in the cockpit, then these two humans must establish a uh, bi-directional trust. They should est establish it in each other and with the AI and vice versa, all kind of combinations. Again, um, commercial in the commercial sector, which I'm more familiar with, uh, there have been airline incidents and disasters uh, due to the lack of trust between the uh, between the the pilot and the co-pilot, um, and there are cases where the the first officer was just uh, too completely intimidated by the uh, by by the pilot to to speak up and correct the pilot, and that led to a disaster. So um, all of these things have to be taken into account, or should be taken into account. So um, just to say a little bit more about the AI establishing trust in the flight crew, uh, there are, as I mentioned before, there are documented cases of suicidal, homicidal uh, commercial aviation pilots whose actions have led to loss of life and, and aircraft. Um, so one thing that can, can take place, and this is another uh, direction I would be interested to see in, in, in anything that's being proposed, is that the onboard AI can, can in, in a pre-flight manner, perform a psychological assessment of the pilot, co-pilot, and choose, in some cases, not to hand over control of the aircraft to the humans. Should, the, uh, should this assessment uh, convince the AI that at least one of them is not psychologically fit for, for the flight? Uh, and again, I, I've, if I haven't mentioned this before, uh, there have been air, air disasters and incidents involving sleep deprived pilots and those under the uh, influence of drugs or alcohol. Uh, there was one well-documented case of a, of, a, of a pilot who uh, spent the entire night, spent the entire night uh, prior to um, going to the airport for his flight, uh, snorting cocaine. I mean, the, these, these things do happen. So, um, so the AI can similarly perform pre-flight assessments of this nature. That would be the goal. So there are other um, there are other uh, factors that uh, there are other situations where the AI can play a role. And I just want to give a very short video. Uh, AI can can and is beginning to play a role in air traffic control, which is related to the problem I'm posing here. And it's really, uh, why is it a much needed pairing as I'm calling it? Uh, let me just quickly get to where I want. So, this is uh, just um, an animation of the air traffic that's coming in and out of Heathrow and um, you, know, you have early morning transatlantic traffic arriving at Heathrow, but then during the day you have 3,500 3, flights going in and out of London. So I'll just let this run for a little bit longer so you can see the enormity and the complexity of what air traffic control is up against. 
So AI can certainly play a role. So I think we would all agree. And here's another view of, of pretty much the same situation. Now, uh, there has been in August of last year, the uh, US Air Force successfully demonstrated that uh, AI can, per, can play a role in, in the cockpit. Uh, so the, they flew a uh, AI co-pilot on a U-2 spy plane. Now in this, uh, in this exercise, which was highly successful, they did you know, very uh, purposefully uh, limit what the AI was able to do. And we're not talking about an AI, an autopilot that uh, after takeoff takes the aircraft on some route, some predetermined route and then lands the aircraft. We're not talking about that. We're talking about more strategic sort of battlefield situations where the AI, AI can play a role as a co-pilot. And in this case, they gave the AI control of a radar subsystem, which was um, basically uh, on the lookout for ground to air um, uh, weapon systems. And it, it proved to be a very successful, um, uh, this was a demo in, in California, and it was a very successful um, illustration of what AI can do in this setting. So let me uh, just say a little bit about, uh, to finish up, on, on guidance on white paper and proposal submissions. Pr prospective performers should assemble, I, I would say, a multidisciplinary team it doesn't have to cover all of the disciplines that might be needed because that, that's probably not feasible, but some areas that should be considered to be covered are uh, control, AI, obviously, avionics, uh, psychology, human factors, computer science, you know, things of that nature. Uh, and then describe how research in this area might progress over a two to five uh, year period from concept to implement, implementation and realization. And as I alluded to earlier, this challenge problem is not limited to establishing bi-directional trust in the cockpit. Other application areas are, are certainly welcomed as, uh, as, as part of a proposal. Um, you know, not for the white paper submission, but after, uh, if the white paper gets funded, after that, that uh, period of funding, uh, one would hope to see a, a working demo involving uh, a properly trained DNN or deep neural network on some, on some facet of, of the problem. And I believe that's all I have. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Uh, this is definitely an interesting uh, problem and uh, hopefully there's some out there listening that have some ideas of what uh, might be done in a year's time to, to set up this for, uh, for future uh, uh, work. Um, so th you gave one sort of example here and, and most of your, um, your, your talk has been within you know, the context of humans in uh, working in a, in, a, in a cockpit with an AI system. Yes. Um, what, what do you uh, see as more uh, non, you know, say military or non uh, uh, major um, uh, business applications for this that you could see that uh, these types of, of um, areas would be, uh, this type of problem is, is essential? Uh, definitely uh, medical situations. Um, we are, already see AI and robotics in, in the uh, operating, in the OR, in the operating room, helping with or actually performing surgery. So I think uh, a collaboration in the OR or in other medical situations uh, is a very, very uh, open area for that, yes. Okay, um, and another question that came through is back to the aviation um, about um, if, if we really think that there's the potential for AI systems causing a aviation accidents, what, what are the key things that need to be improved in these systems in order to um, minimize that potential for error and maybe identify the things that a human could do to, uh, to catch those errors? Yeah. Um, yeah, so the, the, the human should be able to wrest control away from the AI 
Oh, and or just or simply disable it if uh, if the human thinks that that is the um, most beneficial course of action to take. Uh, also, I, I alluded to or mentioned this uh, online monitoring uh, or online verification that could be part of this collaboration that could be checking on the AI and alert the human as well when something is amiss according to the, uh, the, the software that is doing this online monitoring of the AI. Uh, unmute there. Um, so in, in that sense, do you think um, we'll eventually have AIs that are monitoring other AI systems? Someone well, that's, that's interesting. Uh, yeah, I, I think that's uh, absolutely possible. You can have uh, graded levels of, of trust in these, uh, in these AIs that you mentioned. Okay. Um, that, that's very interesting. I yeah. came through is... Um, uh, about, uh, you know, we've been talking primarily about bilateral uh, trust here, but what about uh, uh, multilateral trust when we have a, uh, the idea of a bunch of people trying to make decisions and each relying maybe they're on their own uh, little me AI system and uh, yep. them collaborating together and it's a, it's a group decision rather than a, uh, yep. and we don't have a, an established hierarchy. What uh, what additional complexities uh, does that add to this kind of problem? Um, yeah, it's it certainly uh, it does add complexities. It, I don't think it necessarily has to be uh, hierarchical, but uh, but of course that is one interesting um, architecture for that kind of system. Um, but uh, I think there um, some idea of consensus rules will, will play a role. Is that something that you're hoping to see within the uh, extension of this uh, of this type of a topic? Uh, actually, that, that would be great to see some 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 dis discussion towards towards that goal. Okay, so um, looks like we don't have any other questions right now. But again, thank you very much. And uh, is there anything else you wanted to, to finish up with before we uh, move on to our fourth uh, topic? No, just uh, thanks to uh, the organizers and, and thanks to uh, thanks for the questions. And th and thank you, Dave, for your uh, organization of the session. All right, great. Thank you very much. All right, so uh, yeah, Scott, if you could uh, just uh, release the control of the screen, I'll uh, take it back again, and uh, we'll move on to our fourth uh, our fourth topic here. So um, hopefully you're um, getting to the point now where you're. Uh, uh, getting some idea of how we're how we're moving through this, uh, maybe have some additional questions. Uh, and again, we're going to let you uh, talk to the um, to the presenters uh, going through um, later on. We'll have more of an open conversation. Um, I'll jump back and forth between the various uh, topics and uh, see if things that I can help with, and uh, the other organizers will be around also. So our fourth topic, um, running a little bit ahead of time here, but uh, our fourth topic is on trustworthy AI certification. And this is a uh, more specific topic. The sponsor is IBM and the SUNY system. Um, as Mira said earlier, there's a uh, established relationship now between IBM and SUNY. And this is one of the topics that came out of that uh, relationship. Um, it's open to uh, U.S. and international um, academic institutions. I might have to check on that. Um, let, me, let me check on that for the eligibility. Uh, it's definitely right in the, um, in, the, uh, in the RFP. And our topic presenter is Dr. Uh, Kush Varshney uh, from IBM Research. So I will check on that and I'll give the... Uh, microphone and the Zoom screen over to you, and uh, you can share your uh, talk with us. Awesome, thank you, Professor Dorman. And yeah, I think the uh, eligibility is uh, only for SUNY faculty, so we can um, confirm that. Um, That's what I thought. I uh, apologize, that's my uh, 
my uh, copying of uh, mm -hmm. eligibility from one slide to another and missing that. Yeah. So thank you very much. I'll yep. change that right now. Sure. Um, yeah, so it's my pleasure to be here. Um, thank you everyone for joining and uh, thanks to the organizers. Uh, so yeah, this is all about trustworthy AI certification. And uh, yeah, if you haven't heard enough about trust and trustworthiness, uh, this is just a little bit more uh, in a slightly different direction. Okay. Uh, so before I uh, jump in, I just wanted to give you all um, a very brief introduction into um, IBM Research um, and our AI strategy and our mission. Um, so we've already heard today about uh, kind of uh, general AI as kind of a um, end state. Um, and we're kind of uh, right now at more of a, a narrow AI situation. Um, uh, so our perspective is uh, there's something in between, which is uh, broad AI. And this broad AI is uh, all about learning with less data and less computation, um, doing things across domains and across tasks and uh, making things more trustworthy. So uh, the ovals that you see, we kind of start with advancing AI. Um, then we move on to trusting AI, which is the topic here, which includes fairness, explainability, robustness, and transparency, and then uh, scaling AI, including automation. Uh, so my perspective is a little bit different, um, given uh, that uh, uh, IBM's uh, whole mission is uh, to create business machines. Um, uh, so AI is powering uh, many critical workflows and uh, trust is essential. So those critical enterprise workflows include loan processing, employment, uh, customer management, quality control, and so forth. Right? And uh, there's many factors um, that are placing trust in AI as a top priority for a lot of businesses. Um, one of them is uh, to ensure their brand reputation. Uh, another is uh, because of increased regulation um, in many different uh, regulated industries, uh, which include uh, fair housing, fair lending, fair employment, and so forth. Um, uh, just this past week uh, in Europe, uh, they released um, a draft version of an AI regulation um, that will be uh, quite strict. Right? Um, a third reason is uh, the complexity of AI deployments. So many organizations will have, uh, or if they don't yet, they will soon have hundreds or thousands of models um, running around for the different sort of practices that, that they need to do. And kind of managing all of those is a question of trust as well. And finally, um, as we all recall um, from last summer, uh, uh, there was uh, a lot of protests uh, in reaction to the George Floyd uh, uh, murder and uh, uh, a greater increase in the focus on social justice. So uh, these are all kind of reasons why um, uh, trust in AI is becoming uh, a, a priority for, for a lot of folks. Okay. Um, so if we were to ask, um, what does it take to trust a decision made by a machine? And Dr. Steckman kind of uh, touched on this uh, in some capacity, but let me repeat it as well. Uh, so the first sort of thing that we require um, is that these uh, the, the decisions coming out of a machine are accurate. So uh, without the accuracy, we don't have anything else uh, in terms of trust. But um, uh, there's many considerations that go beyond just accuracy. So uh, is the model fair? Is it easy for people to understand? Is the overall system uh, meant to end, uh, have some transparency? Um, has it gone stale? Um, was it trained on some data that is no longer valid um, based on the current distribution that we're seeing? Um, and is it robust to uh, attacks by adversaries? Um, and we also somewhat talked about uh, trust, um, worthiness as compared to trust. Um, are uh, being trusted. So um, uh, these are some definitions, um, mainly from the organizational management literature that um, characterize the worthiness of trust, the inherent attributes of a person or an AI system that make it worthy of the trust. Um, so the first attribute is, um, for people at least, is some sort of competence uh, that they can do what they say that they do, um, which maps for machine learning systems to accuracy. Uh, the second attribute is uh, some level of reliability so that, that competence sticks around in different conditions, different settings, and so forth. Um, so this maps in a machine learning sense to uh, distributional robustness, uh, fairness, and adversarial robustness. Uh, the third attribute uh, 
there's some level of intimacy or openness, the ability to go back and forth with the person or the machine system. And uh, this maps uh, in two directions. One is from the machine to the human. So explainability and transparency are uh, useful for that. And then the other direction from the human to the machine uh, for us to instruct the machine of what are you know, the values that we would like. And uh, value alignment is the term given for that. And then finally, um, the fourth attribute is some level of selflessness that you want the other person or the system to uh, not just be working for their own goals, but uh, to take into account um, uh, benefits to society. And uh, this maps to uh, some level of empowerment of people to use uh, AI um, and for AI to be used in, in social good. Right. Um, so here's a quote from uh, one of the early uh, uh, CEOs of IBM, uh, Thomas J. Watson Sr., um, who said that the toughest thing about the power of trust is that it's very difficult to build and very easy to destroy. Right? Um, so we're not going to talk about destroying uh, trust here, but um, talk more about building it up. Right? Um, and Dr. Steckman talked about uh, trustworthiness uh, being throughout the life cycle. Right? Um, so on the image on the right, um, we see a typical life cycle of creating a machine learning model. And this is an adaptation of what's known as the CRISP-DM methodology. Uh, so there are several phases, um, starting from problem specification, uh, data understanding, data preparation. Then there's modeling, which many people see as kind of the main task, but I would argue that it's only one of many. Uh, there's evaluation and deployment. Um, and you see different personas uh, who are involved in these different steps. And one set of uh, personas that you often don't see on these sort of diagrams is a set of diverse stakeholders, especially those from marginalized groups, um, uh, who we should be taking input from uh, as we're defining a problem specification, evaluating a system and so forth, because uh, many times uh, trust is a question of power and uh, uh, when people who are not in power um, get affected by AI systems, um, their voices need to be heard as well. Um, so talking about these different sort of um, areas or different uh, sort of attributes, um, uh, so we can list kind of five of them, uh, accuracy, fairness, explainability, adversarial robustness, and robustness to distribution shift. Um, so all five of them, uh, we've, as a community, have been making progress on how to compute metrics uh, that quantify these different topics or different pillars of trust. Um, there are choices to be made um, in terms of what we mean by fairness or what we mean by um, adversarial robustness in terms of a threat model and so forth. But, um, uh, but I mean, that is a consideration for sure. Um, but the point that I wanted to emphasize here is that um, uh, that, uh, that, I mean, we do have a sense of, of what these metrics are, right? Um, the picture on the right um, is a figure um, kind of illustrating a, a pentathlon, a modern pentathlon. So uh, we can think about wanting um, these AI systems and machine learning systems to do well across many dimensions, uh, not just accuracy, okay? similar to a, to a pentathlon. Yeah. Um, what we also have started to understand a little bit is um, how to collect information throughout the life cycle in meaningful ways. Um, so those could be intended uses of um, these machine learning systems. They could be um, these quantitative metrics for um, accuracy, fairness, explainability, adversarial robustness, and distributional robustness, um, and so forth, right? Um, and how they're uh, captured and how they um, uh, need to be uh, sort of presented to uh, uh, to various personas throughout the life cycle. So we're at a starting point here, um, but what we don't really know is um, how to elicit acceptable ranges of trust metrics for specific applications, because uh, there is no universal um, sort of set of metrics or um, uh, bounds on those metrics that are applicable for, for all use cases in all settings. Uh, so that's something that is uh, very much an open problem uh, because this needs to be a judgment from policymakers and those diverse stakeholders and how to uh, kind of bring everything together, um, elicit these, uh, these ranges is uh, something that no one has, uh, has figured out. And one complicating factor on this is that uh, 
these dimensions are not separable. They're not independent. Um, there are actually relationships and fundamental trade-offs among the different uh, trust dimensions and, uh, and and so forth. And uh, we actually don't know um, very well what those relationships are. So uh, characterizing those uh, relationships is another open problem that uh, uh, we would like to, uh, to look at in, in this challenge. And lastly, what we don't know is what constitutes an AI certification. So even if we can measure these quantities um, and we can measure them throughout the life cycle um, from the data scientist to the validator to the deployment, um, uh, we don't know uh, what would where we could say that, yes, this is signed off. Um, so there's this concept of a uh, declaration of conformity um, where someone has tested out a system and they sign their name and say, say that, yes, this is certified to be used. Um, and uh, there is no uh, way to do this currently in, in AI systems. So uh, we really need to um, make progress on, on this topic. So uh, to kind of conclude um, in terms of the challenge description, uh, what this challenge is all about is to um, use expertise from human factors engineering, from machine learning, from software engineering, uh, game theory, especially when there's uh, multiple policymakers or these diverse stakeholders who we need to elicit things from uh, psychology, policy, law, and other disciplines um, to uh, specifically develop novel methods for um, the following three items. Uh, so the first is to elicit um, from people, from humans, um, uh, feasible trust-related policies. Um, and it's not always just from single stakeholders, but from committees of uh, multiple stakeholders, including those from uh, traditionally marginalized groups. Uh, the second is operationalizing these trust policies as a means for certifying AI models. So how to fuse beliefs towards different elements of trust and summaries that uh, can be regulated. So. Um, when I show this, uh, this table, for example, there's many metrics, but uh, some people would prefer there would be a single trust number, a single trust metric. So how to construct that, which is not going to be um, universal, as I said before, it's going to be uh, dependent on the application and, uh, and, and so forth, and uh, how to put regulations on that. And the last point is, uh, creating end-to-end -end tools for developers and third parties to, uh, to govern these AI models uh, throughout the life cycle. Right? Um, so that's the, uh, the, the overall sort of challenge description and uh, I'm happy to, uh, to take further questions. So thank you. Well, great, uh, thank you very much. Um, so yeah, we have a, we have a number of, of questions. Um, let me see if I can try to order these in, in sort of a, uh, a reasonable, um, a reasonable way. So one of the questions um, deals with um, the level of importance of various um, things such as social justice um, when, when developing these AI systems. Um, we have this concept right now, you know, of, of sort of uh, narrow AI and uh, our, our, you know, view that maybe we could make something that is, uh, you know, unbiased, but it would have to be for a very narrow, narrow problem. Um, how, how do you anticipate, um, you know, in this kinds of certification processes and things, being able to use these um, criteria for um, generating or creating more accurate AI systems? Yeah, so um, some of these other considerations beyond accuracy, like the fairness or explainability or robustness, um, are trade-offs with accuracy. Some of them are not. Um, some of them can be achieved simultaneously. Um, and even that answer itself depends a little bit on the worldview that you have. Um, so uh, we recently had a paper um, at ICML, uh, which kind of analyzed things and said, um, is there really a trade-off between fairness and accuracy? And the normal way people measure accuracy is um, they measure it with respect to a data set that they have, um, which is a, usually a held out set from uh, the distribution that they've that they've been given, right? Um, but if we think about it uh, just for a second, that data is already biased, right? Um, it, it already includes uh, different social biases, and so 
uh, does it really make sense to measure accuracy with respect to something um, that, that's already biased? And uh, what we show in our um, previous work is that uh, if you believe that um, uh, the, the data set that you have um, uh, does not have any social biases, then there is no trade-off between accuracy and fairness. But if it uh, does have social biases in terms of how you're measuring accuracy, um, uh, it, there is, and that's what most people observe. So, uh, so it's really, I mean, a, a broader question in, in many senses, and this applies to the different metrics and how they're interrelated. Uh, in terms of uh, how we should weight them, uh, this is not going to be universal. Uh, so depending on what you're doing, what sort of application area it is, um, what the values that you want to encode are, uh, there will be different sort of um, weights given to, to these things. And uh, I think that is the core sort of uh, elicitation problem that, that we are facing. So sort of related to that, uh, what, what, uh, what methods are typically used to, to, to understand and, and to measure these trust mm -hmm. metrics? Yeah, so um, these are now starting to be well known. Um, so. Uh, for distributional robustness, it's uh, pretty straightforward. Um, uh, you're measuring accuracy when the distribution has changed. Right? So construct a different distribution, see how well the accuracy um, uh, stays uh, as high as it was on the uh, held out data set that you had. Um, for fairness, uh, there are um, several different definitions, uh, many of which uh, have been uh, sort of discussed in, in various sort of uh, uh, places and venues. One example is a statistical parity difference, which is looking at uh, the difference in selection rates across groups. Uh, and those groups could be defined by protected attributes such as race, and race gender, ethnicity, things of that sort. Um, a different fairness metric uh, is known as uh, equalized odds. And uh, there, what you're not looking at is the difference in the selection rate, um, which would be like a y hat equals one rate. Um, uh, but what you're actually looking at is uh, the uh, the difference in the false positive and false negative rates across the groups. Um, so uh, that would be another example of a fairness metric. Um, for uh, explainability, there have been some recent uh, proposals of explainability metrics. So looking globally, um, at a, uh, at a machine learning model, um, how well does it approximate a simpler model that people can understand? So a decision tree or um, some other uh, similar sort of thing. So uh, there are starting to be these sort of explainability metrics as well. And then on the adversarial robustness side, um, uh, there are several uh, metrics out there. Um, uh, empirical robustness is one. Um, another one is called the clever score. Um, so all of these are uh, somewhat looking at the uh, decision boundary of a classifier and seeing uh, how easy it is to fool um, uh, that model by um, making small perturbations uh, to an input similar to uh, uh, what uh, Dr. Velasquez uh, showed earlier. So um, uh, there are starting to be these metrics out there. And um, uh, so, uh, so I don't think that this challenge should really be focused on coming up with necessarily new metrics, um, although that is certainly okay to do. Um, but the broader question is to uh, think about what are the relationships among these different metrics? Uh, how should we elicit um, uh, from users which uh, specific choices um, among uh, these different metrics for a given uh, pillar uh, should be done? How we should uh, elicit what are acceptable ranges um, of them and uh, what is feasible for the fact that um, some of them cannot be achieved together, um, some of them can. And then finally, having the uh, overall sort of system architecture to, to do this in, in uh, kind of the, the AI life cycle that we have. Okay, great. I apologize, I got a little bit of uh, construction going on in the background here. But um, so one of the things that I've been particularly um, impressed about in, in some of the work uh, coming out of IBM, um, and in fact, uh, certain SUNY uh, leadership, and I have talked about this extensively, is these toolkits. Uh, that you have the 360 toolkits. Are there things in there that um, address uh, um, address trust uh, trust right now? And what do you think is sort of the next evolution of of these toolkits? Yeah, so um, there are three toolkits: uh, AI Fairness 360, AI Explainability 360, and the Adversarial Robustness Toolbox 360. And um, 
Uh, all of them are open source. Um, they, we actually at IBM Research uh, donated them to the Linux Foundation uh, just a few months ago. And they do have implementations of uh, all of these metrics that we talked about. Um, uh, but what they don't have is anything to sit on top of them. So uh, they're just there. Um, so the, they kind of rely on the data scientist or the policymaker to um, figure out what are the appropriate metrics for a given use case and what are those acceptable ranges and so forth. Um, so the missing piece is really um, uh, everything that kind of sits on top of the, uh, the uh, these individual metric uh, computations and so forth. Uh, the toolkits also um, uh, have uh, mitigation algorithms uh, as well in addition to the metrics. Um, uh, so I think that came up earlier in one of the uh, the talks as well. So uh, yeah, I mean, those toolkits are out there. Um, they can be certainly used as a starting point, but um, uh, there's an entire uh, kind of stack uh, that they're just the foundation for, I would say. Um, another of our uh, activities is something that we call the AI Fact Sheets effort. Um, so there is also a website called AI Fact Sheets 360. And um, uh, this does show um, one of the slides that I had before, which was um, kind of the generation of facts and kind of capturing them. Uh, so that's an early effort. Um, we don't have tools um, released for, for that, but um, it kind of sets forth one possibility of how uh, uh, one could potentially think about uh, uh, capturing this information throughout the life cycle. But it's certainly something that uh, we feel can be improved upon. So yeah, that's very interesting. Um, I guess, you know, you're absolutely right. You need these core things and then the sort of the next level above that sort of open to uh, interpretation uh, to some extent or application dependence. So um, yeah, that's probably a, uh, a good thing, but I'm sure you're using those toolkits internally to, to do uh, more um, specific things. That's, that's great. I think it's been a great uh, contribution to the community. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. Um, so your, your um, uh, answers have been very intriguing, and I'm not surprised that this happened, but someone asked if you could talk a little bit more about how fairness and accuracy interact. You know, are, for example, are there cases where increase in accuracy would lead to the AI being less fair, for example? Yeah, um, so again, uh, as I was saying before, it really depends on how you define accuracy, um, as well as which metric you've chosen for fairness. So. Um, uh, one way to think about it is uh, that there's some construct space or some uh, some sort of world in which there are no social biases, in which the features truly represent the underlying ability of the person or object uh, that we're talking about. And if we are measuring accuracy in that space, um, and uh, then there, when we look at, let's say, an equalized odds, which I just described a couple minutes ago as a fairness metric, um, uh, there actually is no trade-off between fairness and accuracy um, when accuracy is measured in that way. Um, but when um, accuracy is measured with respect to um, uh, uh, the kind of a distribution that's not in the construct space, but um, is in some other observed space that uh, uh, includes uh, the, uh, the biases and the features that um, uh, might be, for example, um, like an SAT score um, for college admissions, right? Um, some people might think that uh, it's a true representation of the underlying ability of the candidate, um, whereas some people might say that uh, the questions themselves uh, are somewhat biased because depending on your personal lived experiences and so forth, um, you just might do worse um, on, on that test uh, compared to others. Then uh, that's an example of a social bias. And if the data already includes those sort of social biases, then uh, that is the case where we do observe um, that uh, fairness and explain, uh, fairness and accuracy do trade off. So um, it's really a question of how you define things and uh, uh, kind of what you're looking at. So if there, you're in a kind of ideal world, which is where maybe you should be measuring accuracy, then uh, you don't have to, the trade off but, um, in the data that you get to have in your hands. Um, maybe you do. So it's a little bit complicated for that reason. Yeah, I agree 100%. Um, you know, we, we all want to uh, measure things in the uh, ideal world, but we want them to operate in, uh, uh, in places where they can be better than humans. So uh, interesting. Uh, one last thing, I'll uh, wrap up. Um, this, is, this is sort of a combination of a couple of questions, but in general, uh, given that 
you know, certification or, or what's, uh, what we want to certify could be culturally dependent, for example. Is there any way to make AI a trustworthy with regard to, you know, the entire human race, or is it always going to be application or problem dependent? Yeah, I think it's always going to be um, dependent on the context in which you're working because um, uh, let's say we look at legal definitions, right? Um, so uh, when you're even in the US in two very similar sort of applications with so fair housing and uh, uh, fair employment, uh, they don't have exactly the same list of uh, protected attributes. Um, so there's slight differences in them. Uh, so even in that very sort of, you would expect them to be almost the same. They were both passed in the 1960s in the same civil rights sort of era, um, uh, but they are different from each other. So um, if those are different, then you can imagine when you're uh, talking about healthcare or you're talking about some other country or um, some other continent, um, uh, there certainly will be um, uh, differences. So. Uh, we shouldn't expect there to be a universal sort of um, uh, sort of things. We do need some level of precision. So certification, that's why I think it is uh, is complicated and that's why it's worthy of research. Um, so how do you elicit for a given application domain, for a given jurisdiction, for a given set of stakeholders, um, uh, what constitutes uh, a solution or an AI system that uh, we could say is is okay is is, is certified to, to be used in, in that setting. Yeah, great. Uh, maybe like the other things, we'll eventually have an AI system that can certify other AI systems. Yep. <laughs> we'll see. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate your uh, addressing questions for this uh, topic, and uh, hopefully, we'll get some good uh, white paper submissions and. Uh, uh, give us uh, something to really uh, to uh, really consider over the next year. So thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, I want to thank all of our um, individual uh, presenters here. Um, they're representing uh, a much larger group of those interested in these types of problems, uh, both within the U.S. government, in the academic community, in the business communities. Um, and so, like I said, these are things that are on the critical path. Um, hopefully you've gotten uh, enough information to uh, whet your appetite for these topics. Um, I certainly have. And um, we uh, have a, uh, 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 an interesting time ahead of us coming up with some neat ideas that are gonna set you apart from, uh, from others. And so again, thank you to all four of our uh, presenters and uh, now I believe we're gonna hear a little bit more about the actual process for um, submitting these and how they're gonna be evaluated. So uh, Mike, I'm gonna turn it back over to you and uh, let you continue with uh, the program. Thanks Dave, uh, and thanks. That was a great discussion and I'm sure uh, lots of valuable information for the listeners out there uh, to help them better understand those challenge problems. Um, so, uh, so great, great discussion by everyone. Uh, so for those who don't remember me, uh, my name is Mike Granero. I am the small business professional for the uh, AFRL Information Directorate here in Rome, New York. Uh, I came to the lab in 2002 uh, in contracting. I was a contracting officer. And then in 2017, I transitioned over to the small business office to manage our small business portfolio. Uh, so really my role is to ensure that small businesses uh, have as much opportunity to bid and perform uh, with the government uh, to help collaborate with us on research uh, and really to, uh, uh, to advocate for those small businesses to help us execute our mission. Uh, the Air Force has a strong commitment to small businesses, to academia and uh, you know, to the warfighter. Um, so, so that's something that, uh, that we take uh, uh, right down to our core and it's part of our core mission. Uh, and through events like this, through the Trusted AI Challenge Series, it gives me a great opportunity uh, to not just collaborate with industry and government and academic partners, but also to help work with those startups and help cultivate them uh, and help prepare them uh, should they be interested in doing uh, in partnering with the Air Force uh, with some of our goals uh, down the road. Uh, so this is a great opportunity for us. Uh, and also through my role uh, in the Small Business Office, I'm able to help support that stellar performance that AFRL has 
and working with small businesses. So, uh, for example, uh, last year, last fiscal year, fiscal year 20, uh, AFRL obligated more than $2 billion to small businesses out of its entire portfolio, which is a tremendous number. And 670 million of that came right from our facility here in Rome, New York. Uh, so that's a strong demonstration of the commitment that we have to small businesses um, to, to help com uh, complete the mission that we have here uh, within AFRL. Uh, and also not just over uh, the general small business category, but uh, $58 million went to small disadvantaged businesses. $117 million went to women-owned businesses. Uh, so a strong commitment uh, to help cultivating and fostering relationships with those small businesses and helping us execute our mission. Uh, so now for those of you that followed the Trusted AI Challenge Series, uh, this was probably the most anticipated event uh, in this series for you because you learned about the challenge problems. You got to see them on the website. You are able to see those uh, solicitations to uh, give you information uh, about uh, submitting white papers and potentially receiving funding. Uh, so with that, I'll kind of reiterate, reiterate some of the information that you heard from Dr. Dorman uh, about each topic, uh, as well as the eligibility and award and funding criteria. Uh, just remember, though, that uh, anything you're hearing online, you can find that and more detail uh, on the Trusted AI Challenge Series webpage, which is, which is hosted right on Innovare. So topic number one, titled Verification of Autonomous System, and topic number two, titled Human Artificial Intelligence Performance Optimization, Trust and Joint Action for Digital Data Analysis. Those are both sponsored by AFRL and AFOSR. Now, these two topics are open to proposers from US and international academic institutions. Awards for these topics will be targeted up to $100,000 per effort for one year performance with an expectation to fund anywhere from one to three awards per topic. Topic, uh, remember that was topic number one and topic number two. Topic number three, titled Dynamic Bidirectional Trust in Human Artificial Intelligence Collaborative Systems is sponsored by the National Security Innovation Network and NYSTEC. This topic is open to US-based academic institutions and small businesses. One award will be made under this topic, valued at $75,000, with approximately uh, three-month performance. And topic number four, titled Trustworthy AI Certification, is sponsored by IBM and the State University of New York. This topic is open to faculty members from all SUNY state-operated colleges. Uh, so good information there. Again, refer back to the website just to verify the eligibility, uh, and hopefully uh, you'll find some great opportunities there for you to submit a white paper. Uh, so one award will be made under that topic number four uh, at $100,000 for one year uh, of performance. This project will also be invited to submit a renewal proposal at the end of that year, depending on the progress that's made. Uh, so common among all four topics is the submission of a two-page white paper due on June 4th, 2021 by 5 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, each topic submission uh, has a specific email address. So again, refer to that Trusted AI Challenge Series webpage, click on those RFPs to find out the submission info and to get uh, the email address for submission of your white papers, as well as submission uh, of any questions that you may have about the topics. Uh, so another important thing, uh, you know, with any competition, there will always be some great ideas or solutions that will not receive funding. Uh, these, these types of events get very competitive. Uh, so I'd also like to mention that the best way to get plugged in and get your capabilities in front of the broadest audience across the Air Force is really through our new service to connect site called airforcetechconnect.org. And I'll repeat that, it's airforcetechconnect.org. And you'll go to the share an idea uh, section where you can enter your capabilities. Uh, that information gets paired with subject matter experts. And should there be a match or interest in your capabilities, they'll be able to reach out to you directly and you'll be able to engage with them one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, so it's a great new tool that uh, helps bridge that gap that we have seen historically in connecting industry with those government subject matter experts. Uh, so it's a great new tool, I'm excited about it. Um, it's helped me connect a lot of small businesses to the right folks. Uh, and although it's only been out since last fall, I've seen some great success from it. Uh, I'd also like to take this opportunity to give a huge thank you uh, to our event organizers, stakeholders, technical committee members, 
uh, and sponsors for these challenges. Uh, and, and for me, it's really important to, to point these folks out because this never would have been able to, uh, to happen, this event, uh, without those folks. So a special thank you to the folks at AFRL, AFOSR, Ensign, NYSTEC, IBM, the SUNY system, and the Griffiths Institute. Thank you so much, everybody, for your participation here. Um, you've helped make this challenge series possible. Uh, and then the last note that I have for you, uh, all Trusted AI Challenge Series awardees will be invited to present their challenge solution as part of the third and final event in the series, Trusted AI at Scale. Uh, it's scheduled to take place virtually uh, the 27th and 28th of July, 2021. Uh, and it offers an opportunity for the awardees to present their solutions to top researchers and leaders from both government, academia, and industry who will either be participating in the event or part of the audience. Uh, and speaking of trusted AI at scale, it's a great segue for me to bring back my good friend and colleague, Dr. Bryant Wysocki, to talk about why we're merging the Trusted AI Challenge Series with the Air Force Cyber Sitter Pitch Day under the brand Trusted AI at Scale. Bryant? All right, thank you, Mike. So this is a great opportunity for me to expand about the third and final event in the Trusted AI Challenge Series. Um, this is an event that will be combined with, with a much larger Air Force Pitch Day event to take place in July. As you saw today in event two, we presented four technical topics uh, with funding uh, so that we can receive proposals and white papers and an award um, these contracts to proposers. And I, I wanna talk a little bit about event number three, accelerating the progress. So event number three is being combined, with, as I said, with another larger Air Force event. And like Mike mentioned, it's going to give winners of this particular challenge series solicitation, the opportunity to introduce themselves, their teams, uh, and the roadmap for their technology solution for any of the challenge problems that they were assigned. Um, you know, as I mentioned, this third, third, third stage will be combined with the Department of Air Force Pitch Day that is, that is titled Trust, Trusted AI at Scale. And like Mike mentioned, it's taking place virtually July 27th and 28th of this year. So we've combined the two events because event three, um, as Denise Lee will talk about shortly, is going to provide additional uh, technology and funding opportunities on a much larger scale than we were able to provide in the Trusted AI Challenge Series. So I invite you to take a look at the, that solicitation as it becomes available. And Denise will talk a little bit about that because the, the Trusted AI at Scale event really grows and expands many of the same topics, subtleties, and, and, and technical challenges that we built and discussed in, in the evolution of this challenge series. So this Trusted AI at Scale as our capstone event this year in July, um, as I mentioned, is a separate and complementary funding opportunity. Um, and it offers a way for us to grow and continue this performance as we build and expand and strengthen this technology ecosystem. So to recap, there is a third event associated with the Trusted AI Challenge Series. It will take place on July 27th, where funded performers can show off their wares on the national stage, but it will be part of a much larger Department of the Air Force pitch day on related topics, bringing trust, trusted AI at scale to the Department of the Air Force and the DOD. So it is now my pleasure to introduce Ms. Denise Lee, who will provide additional details on the Cyber Center opportunities and specifically the Air Force pitch day programs. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Dr. Waisaki, for the introduction. Being an AFRL RI Cyber Center Program uh, Manager for over the last 14 years, I am so excited to have the ability to support the mission of the Warfighter on a daily basis, as well as throughout today's virtual event. 
I'm proud to be the program manager uh, for the local Sipper Sitter program and to lead the unique uh, approach through this series of events. Obviously, amid through the, the COVID-19 um, times to spur and elevate cross-collaboration with new potential partners um, and with other technical directorates for technology research, development, commercialization, and transition. It's my pleasure to talk about the Trusted AI uh, pitch day um, at scale today and about the Ask Me Anything that will be happening on May 5th from 1 to 3, where Dr. Waisaki and myself will be actually working with NYSTEC to discuss all of the um, opportunities for the small businesses that are out there and any questions on the current 21.2, uh, 21.b uh, 21 topics that, will, um, that are in pre-release as of right now. Currently, we have had the opportunity to have an $18 million trusted AI at scale pitch day. 15 million in SIBR topics and 3 million in SITR topics. The funding total obviously is 18 million in possible awards. And you know, with the trusted AI pitch day has many stakeholders um, that have really put so much time and effort into making this uh, trusted AI technology, um, very um, impressive. So we really want to make sure that we reach out to the ecosystem um, and help build the trusted AI uh, technology solutions and all of that in the defense needs uh, down the line. You know, please take time to visit the DOD Cyber Sitter site to see all of the, the current topics that are on pre-release that are listed there. I kind of want to take the time now to kind of get past the, the trusted AI and, and pitch event. And I want to talk about the um, upcoming AFWorks open topics that you have the opportunities to um, propose to, as well as we have the upcoming Air Force 21.3 and 21.3C uh, center that will happen in August timeframe. So mark that on your calendars if you guys want to have the opportunity to actually go and propose um, to the topics that will be put in there. And that's on the Air Force uh, website as well as sam.gov. There's like all of the places that you can um, look all of these, these um, opportunities up. So, you know, it, it's an opportunity to be able to learn and grow um, in this community. And I think that with the Trusted AI Challenge Series, as well as the Trusted AI at Scale Pitch Day, will give this such a, a big, broad um, view and, and all of the, the stakeholders that are involved and the ecosystem that will build from there. So, you know, I'd like to take this time and uh, thank everybody for the opportunity. And I hope to see you at the AMA and at the Trusted AI Pitch Day. And I'm looking forward to the proposal submissions and seeing what we can do um, for the future. It is my now my pleasure to introduce Mr. Mike Wessing from Griffiths Institute, who will give you information on the in, on Innovare. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Good afternoon. As Denise said, I'm Mike Wessing. I'm the chief engineer here at the Griffiths Institute. I was asked to present a little bit about what Innovari is, Innovari Advancement Center. You see in the banners behind the presenter here, and we're wondering what is this all about? Well, it's a concept we have here in Rome, and actually it's kicked off by the research lab. They wanted to create an open environment for research to be able to come to not only national, but international researchers, industry, academic partners, to be able to come here to share their, their research ideas, provide collision areas for new ideas come out of. And they came to the Griffiths Institute about two years ago and asked us, will we join this adventure with them? And we said, sure, because this partnership in America that we have that's part of our roles has helped them achieve their tech transfer goals and to create these uh, basic research ideas. So we partnered with the local United County government and New York State and uh, transformed a 1950s era SAC Strategic Air Command uh, operations 
building into a state-of-the-art research, basic level research area. It's approximately 150,000 square feet if you go from hangar to hangar as part of the complex with about 37,000 square feet in the middle of the area that the Griffiths Institute is creating this open innovation environment area. Our, our area is three floors and with the first floor consisting of two artificial intelligence and machine learning advanced research laboratories of about a thousand square feet each, two quantum research areas of about 1500 square feet each. All these research areas, these laboratories are state-of-the-art uh, research laboratories to be an attractor to bring in some of the best researchers to collaborate with the Air Force Research Lab engineers. On our second floor facility, we have a about 250, excuse me, 250 person uh, laboratory, or excuse me, auditorium that uh, is reconfigurable to whatever uh, configuration and event needs to have the host. It can be a virtual, it can be a live host, uh, hosted yeah. event. We also have three training rooms that are reconfigurable, multiple sizes up to 20 people in a room uh, for different type of training events. But what is really attracting you people who want to come here is our third floor. Our third floor is an open research area of about 13,000 square feet of uh, modern, real uh, innovative design to open up people's minds to, to really collaborate and collide with each other. We have uh, couch areas. We have glass in the room areas with multiple table configurations. We have just open table areas. We have cube areas. Uh, we have high-speed internet, okay, which is Wi-Fi, or it can also be direct connect if you need a, a higher speed capability than our Wi-Fi offers. We have an open patio area, so if you want to research outside, you can watch the runway of the airport and watch airplanes come and go and, and enjoy the great weather of central New York. We uh, um, have uh, agreements with the lab that we share their data sets for researchers to come in. So you bring your laptops in, you can bring a small server in, we can host the server, you can share the data sets with the researchers have. But as this whole area is, it's an open concept to, to have many people, national and international people come here to share ideas, uh, entrepreneurs, brand new business startup businesses come in and share ideas and, and come up with new ideas to, to foster the, the growth of the area of research the Air Force Research Lab in Rome is interested in is in information technology. Other areas of, the, of this complex of the Innovative Advancement Center is a, we are hosting on site is a U, an FAA UAS test range. Uh, this test range is about a 50 mile corridor from here to Syracuse, New York, where they do UAS testing. And uh, currently today, they the started construction of an indoor test range for UAS testing. So they will have a, a multiple layer test capability. Why is it important here? Is because the Air Force Research Labs are right next to one of the state-of-the-art uh, UAS test range in the nation. Okay, so once again, expanding the ideas, where can you take artificial intelligence? Where can you take communications? Where can you take machine learning? So we're trying to be this, this collider event area, this whole space area concept, and we're within walking distance of the government facilities. So there, it's easy to get the government researchers over here to, to collaborate with you, to partner with you, to meet with you, uh, to come in and foster those new ideas that we're trying to create in this ecosystem. What we're trying to do is we're trying to innovate, we're trying to elevate, we're trying to educate, and we're trying to excite people, okay? And the research is critical to not only Rome, but to the nation. And the foundation of some of this research is coming out of, of the Air Force Research Lab across the road from our site. So I, I welcome you to come to Rome sometime. Come see this great new facility that we have here. It's an open facility. It's easy for you to come in and, and see what we have to do. Uh, if any of the winners want to come in and participate and use our facilities, you're all welcome to do that. Like I say, it's a very open and very modern, very bright uh, with, with some of the capabilities that we can support your research with. Uh, with this, I'd like to actually turn it over to Dr. Wasaki, and I appreciate the opportunity to talk a little bit about what the Innovative Advancement Center is. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mike. So we're a little ahead of schedule, and so these are sort of these are the closing remarks. So 
I just want to add a few certain things. So we are really honored to present these challenge topics to you today that we put together um, starting back in October with, with a, an open discussion on the internet with experts from AI um, to talk about the challenges and the requirements to safely deploy these AI systems out into the field, into the public. Um, from there um, and through workshops, we created these challenge problems and they were constructed in a way um, we hope that allows performers to, to tackle focused and precise challenges uh, with, that are appropriate for the amount of money and the time frame given to each of the programs. Um, so in overview, we have approximately $500,000 that we can distribute over these four technical challenges that were presented today. And in a related note, we will have an additional $18 million, $15 million in SIBR money and an additional approximately $3 million in STTRs or SIBR money to focus on um, additional challenges that expand and grow some of these similar topics. So I remind you that all these topics are available for review on our website and through the Innovari website the Innovari Advancement Center. And I'd like to thank everyone that made this possible. Uh, this has really been an interesting challenge series because uh, the funding was from a ground roots uh, perspective and brought together as the challenge problems emerge. And we've had excellent discussions and input from partners at NASA, at Stanford University, at University of California, SUNY, SpaceX, um, AFRL and uh, IBM and other institutes, uh, I think for a very broad and important dialogue. And some of the things that we saw are really the enormous complexity, the subtleties and the importance that are associated with trust of these, these AI systems. These systems are already pervasive in our lives. They're already making recommendations for movies and books. They're, they're helping us manage and plan our day and to sort through music and large amounts of data. But they're going to take on more and more sophisticated roles in our infrastructure, in our medical systems, uh, in national defense, in our power systems and critical infrastructure. And, we're, and they're going to become more than just recommendation systems. They're more and more going to provide us with, with um, suggestions and even oversee humans um, in areas where large amounts of data or the the effectiveness of humans could become in, a que in question. So we have humans, we have human machine teamings, teaming, bi-directional trust in the system that will provide, I think, a much more efficient and much more productive data analysis and design system for the future that goes beyond national defense to take in some of the things we talked about, uh, such as health and welfare and safety of the populace. So. Uh, I would like to invite you, uh, immediately following this presentation, to our Discord chat room, where we'll be, we'll be discussing these topics, where we will have various chat, audio, and video capabilities to further explore these, these technologies, but also to learn more about this, the Cyber Sitter process and about AFRL, Ensign, and NYSTEC as partners uh, in this endeavor. So really, um, it is my honor to thank you for attending and I encourage you to look at these challenge problems, create proposals and compete for funding because it is our aim at AFRL and Innovare to really reach out for the best and brightest across the nation, across the globe to solve the most important technology challenges for our nation uh, and for the world. So again, I'm Bryant Waisaki and on behalf of everyone else, I would like to thank you for joining today. Please continue to talk with us at our Discord chat room. Information on how to join is provided on the YouTube page. And thanks to, again for everyone for your support. I enjoyed talking to you at Discord. Thank you.